Welcome to City Cinema Tech, where the art and pleasure of the movies are the subject of serious discussion. I'm your host, Jerry Carlson, and I teach film studies at the City College of the City University of New York. Today, it's our pleasure to present the 1990 Cuban film, Hello, Hemingway, directed by Fernando Perez. This film tells a coming-of-age story about a young girl in the 1950s in Batista's Cuba who's struggling to get an education and to move on in life. She also happens to be a neighbor of one Ernest Hemingway. We'll be talking about this film after today's screening, and it's a pleasure to welcome to City Cinematheque the distinguished Cuban-American writer, poet, and essayist, Gustavo Perez Firmat. Now, enjoy the many pleasures of Hello, Hemingway. Welcome back to City Cinema Tech. I hope you've enjoyed this opportunity to see what I think is a very moving and extraordinarily interesting portrait of coming of age in Cuba in the 1950s in a period immediately preceding the Cuban Revolution. To talk about those things of interest with us for the next 30 minutes, it's a pleasure to welcome to City Cinema Tech Professor Gustavo Perez Fermat from Columbia uh, University, uh, known as a poet, essayist, uh, critic, and I'd like to mention just two of your more recent works, uh, Life on the Hyphen, uh, about the Cuban-American experience, and your memoir, uh, Next Year in, in Cuba. Welcome to City Cinema Tech, Gustavo. Thank you, Jerry. Great. Let's perhaps, let's start <coughs> with your memoir in the sense that uh, this is a, a, a book, uh, rather a film, that corresponds with a period in, in your life. In what way does this film resonate with, uh, your, with your memories or with your memoir? Well, well very much. Well, as you know, I, I was born in Havana in 1949, and so I was about six, seven years old in 1956, which is when this, this film takes place. And uh, as I was watching the film, it just brought back to me a lot of memories of my childhood, and it sort of it, it sounded right and it looked right. Uh, for example, the, the sort of odd, but to a Havana, Cuba, 1950s, uh, quite typical, normal mixture of Cuban music and American music. You know, from one vitrola, which is, uh, you know, these things you put the money in you, to get the music, you would have Elvis Presley, right. rock and roll. From the one in the next, you know, cafe, you would have, 50s was the Haiti of the cha-cha-cha. So you would have a cha-cha-cha. So you have this rock and roll cha-cha-cha blaring, you know, all the time. Uh, another thing one, one realizes watching this film is to what extent um, Cuban culture of the 1950s was a hybrid culture. Indeed. To what extent, for example, English, not just the music, but the English language was sort of the, the unofficial uh, second language of the city. Um, the, the kids in the movies, in the movie, you know, uh, used taglines in English, speak to each other in English. I remember my, you know, my mother used to always talk to us in English uh, over the dinner table so as to practice what we learned in school. And in school, as, as you can see here, everybody used to learn how to speak English. Right. And that's interesting because there's um, the list of schools that people went to to, uh, to learn English. Does that correspond with your memories? Yeah, but absolutely, because uh, there were a lot of English schools. I mean, schools run by Americans where classes were actually taught at least part of the day in English. I have a cousin who went to a school called Edison, which is mentioned in the film. I had another who went to a school called St. George's, uh, which is also mentioned in the film. So that, you know, the, 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 uh, the setting of the film is quite, quite familiar and uh, I think extraordinary in the way, you know, he manages to recreate, you know, the, the sounds and the, and the feel, the sensibility of that, of that era. Yeah, no, it's also a, a very interesting film because I think of its, of its portrait of who's in Cuba at this point and of, uh, of the, the, the class structure right. as well as the, as, as the racial structure of this. For somebody who hasn't been to, to Havana, uh, could you explain just a little bit about the, the geography that we're, we're, we're working with, about Hemingway's place, where she is and how she fits or does not fit within the city? Yeah. Hemingway used to live, had a, had a finca, you know, yeah. as you see in the film, in a small town called San Francisco de Paula, which was maybe 20 minutes outside Havana by car. Um, next to this town, there was this beach called Cojimar, which is where the fisherman in Hemingway's novel comes from. So uh, this, the, you know, the, the girl in the movie, Larita, uh, apparently, you know, lives 
in San Francisco de, de Paula with her family and then goes to school in Havana in a, in a, at a, at a public school. Right. Right. And one of the things that's interesting about that is that the class structure shows up when she goes to the, um, w when she goes for the interviews because she, that's right. she wants she's to. She's the only one from the public school, right? Yeah. And um, you can also see that when um, she has some papers missing because apparently, you know, her, her father and her mother were not married. And so her birth, her, there's a birth certificate, and the name on the birth certificate is inconsistent right, with the name, in, with a second last name in some other document. And you can also see, you know, class issues there. This girl is somehow, you know, not, not right, or there's something wrong with her because she doesn't have a father, and nobody knows who her father is. Right. And it, well, the other thing is that while she is uh, n not black, she is darker or more mestiza than than other people. So uh, for for me, there's a no. You think by Cuban standards, she's white. Well, I understand. No, I understand. No, I understand. I understand. But you have a key phrase there, and that is by by Cuban right. by Cuban standards. That's and right. we uh, and so there is there seems to be this sensitivity when there's the issue of she's going to the United States yeah. of who you export and That's and there's right. clearly the class issue of you know is she somebody who will be prepared both academically prepared to go but will she be socially you know prepared uh, 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 to go and I think that there's uh, from the part of the Miss Amalia who is who's doing do, doing the judging uh, there's a third component I think it's, it, it's it's a subtle component maybe she's you know should, should I say a bit too Mediterranean mm -hmm. for for uh, for export yeah. at that particular? See, looking at it through what are still Cuban eyes, if not, even after all these years of, of living in this country, I, in the, I you know when, when Ms. Amalia went through the the students who were applying for the scholarship and right. asked their names and gave them the application, I didn't pick up on any racial difference. They all looked like sort of regular. I didn't notice any black Cubans among them. No, there weren't. And there. I didn't notice any racial difference between this girl and the other ones who applied. I noticed class differences as far as the way they were dressed. Right. You know, that was very obvious, uh, even in some of their names. But I didn't, I didn't pick up on what you picked up yeah. on. Well, let, let me tell you one of the reasons I, I took, the, took the lead on that is I happen to have a friend from another Caribbean nation, uh, n n not, not, not Cuba, whose father was the head of a medical school. And when he was sending during the civil rights era or before, before, in the 50s, all of a sudden he discovered when he was sending uh, students that they were going to a distinguished Southern University whose policies are very, very different these days, and so I will not mention, <laughs> mention it, that there were, you know, issues that everybody showed up and, and, and they had always been white in their society. Right. And then all of a sudden they're saying, are you sure about that? What do you mean, are you? Are you sure? So I, I don't think we should, you know, remain on this topic very, very long. But there are a number of different axes that she's being, you know, sort of brought to the rug on. Uh, is, right. is she worthy uh, of this? Now let's talk a little bit about her. Well, well, one thing that's interesting, though, yeah. is here you have somebody who has who is from humble origins, yes, and yet who is very much an Anglophile, or at least a Hemingwayophile, and you know wants to learn English. Uh, wants to come to study in the States. You know, her boyfriend, you know, sort of mocks her. Uh, and when we talk about that a little bit later, what that means, um, because she wants to come to the States. And it shows you how, how far down sort of American culture, sometimes one has the image that, Amer that only the Cuban bourgeoisie and upper classes were anglicized, Americanized. It's not true. Right. Everybody was. Right. Yeah. No, no, I think, that's, I think that's an excellent point. And that she sees this uh, as her a, as her opportunity, and of course she's mocked by her own family when she brings up what do you want to study because mm -hmm. they have a completely now and we, we see how economically marginal they are, and so we both understand for for immediate practical reasons why they're so instrumental in their logic. Right. What we need is food and 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 a job. But we also see that they don't have that larger vision. Or you know that 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 strategic vision of what this can do for her, but she's mocked for the fact that she would want to study arts and um, philosophia. Arts and philosophia, yes. Mm. Imagine philosophia in Western mm. Casa. Yeah. yeah, says says the uh, says the aunt. Right. Uh, yeah. 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 So um, that also I, I find to be 
the, the portrait of this family uh, and the way in which, on the one hand, they're poor and marginal, yet on the other hand, uh, and there certainly are difficulties and rivalries within the family. I mean, it's, it's uh, but it's, it's still, nonetheless, it's not a dysfunctional family. It's a, it's a tension filled. You don't think so? Yeah, well, I think it's, the a, I think it's a pretty terrible family. And beats up on the daughter and... Well, the, the, it, the before that's happening, that's one of the ways in which the, the to my mind, the, the, the politics of the era get into the film, that it's not only just office politics, it's since he is allied with the Batista, uh, but the, the police force is allied with Batista, it's what's going on, and there's the discussion of what's going on at the police station, and he tries to defer it to personnel issues, but we, we know by implication with what's going on with the students, yeah. you know. And also there's, a, there's an important political event that occurs during the film, which is that they mention the, the murder of Salah Cañizares. Yeah, explain that to a North American. Salah Cañizares was, was, I believe, the chief of the Havana police. And in 1956, he was, he was gone down. And I remember actually seeing a photograph with three gunshot wounds, like forming a triangle on, right. his, on his forehead. And um, it was a very... You know, it was a very big yeah. event politically, and it, and it you know uh, led in its turn to a to a crackdown on on anti Batista people um, and to uh, you know a lot of government repression. So well, the, the, this is, it's very clear. This is a period of unrest. What wasn't so clear to me is is where Manolo, Larita's uncle, fell in in this political con, you know sort of puzzle. You know. Right. He seems to talk about it as if it were a personal situation that the that the lieutenant, his boss, doesn't like him, and that's why he's in trouble, and that's why he got fired. And but you know, as you say, I think maybe there's more to it than just personal animosity. Yeah, that, that's that's my reading as well. That he's trying to think of it in those ways, but he knows these other things are going on, and you know, he is even queried, you know, by the family: is is it true the things that go on right. there? And they're not referring to the when they're asking that question. Yeah. That's really a political yeah, question. Very much so. Uh, and we also see the the notion uh, that uh, that because of the turbulence in these last years of Batista, there's the whole issue of the students. The students trying to write their student association rules, right. and they're trying to actually, they're asking her to help them draft them in an allegorical way, because the fellow is saying, well, well, what I want to say is things that can't be said, but it has to be clear that I'm saying what I can't say. Okay. And, and that's an important moment, because you wonder whether that applies to the film itself. I whether at that point, you know, the film is talking about itself, and is actually tipping the viewer off as to how this film should be read, should be interpreted. You know? After all, you know, it's a very dark film. Indeed. It's, uh, at the end, there's no, there's no hope for, right. for this girl. The scene ends with a scene that has become sort of paradigmatic in, in, in Cuban literature and film of the 1990s and 80s, which is a Cuban standing by the seashore looking out at the sea. Right. There's a famous scene like that in strawberry and chocolate, and that scene recurs in many, many novels. You know? So you have this, this movie, very dark movie, very great sense of hopelessness. And this movie's about this girl, 16, 17 years old, who lives under a dictatorship, you know, who lives in a country where housing is scarce, where food is scarce, Indeed. where the government runs schools, suppress dissent, and this girl wants to leave for the United States and can't. You wonder, <laughs> which Cuba is being talked about here? Or is it the Cuba of 1956? Or is it the Cuba of 1990, 1991? Right. And the fact that I can make these parallels is itself perhaps one of the points of the movies. Well, l let me just uh, take your, your point a little bit further, because one of the things that's interesting about this film is it's called Hello, Hemingway. But there's actually no stage scene of dialogue or of direct encounter between our protagonist and between Hemingway. The old bookseller in turn says, well, the way to really get to know someone like Hemingway is through his, is through his works. So what you have is this famous you know, novella of extraordinary quality and, and, and brilliance, who the, even the bookseller is saying, and Mrs. Martinez, give her clues on how to read the book. 
So what you're talking about, this question that you can have a text, and it's a distinguished text, but at different moments, if you enter the text in different ways, you're going to apply it, you're going to interpret it differently, or you're going to apply it to the needs of interpretation that you have mm -hmm. at, that, at that particular moment. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting that we have a, a book that is evoked, but there is no adapted scene from the book in the movie. As close as we come is when she has been you know, inspired by her reading and she's on the beach and she sees the man whom she imagines could be the prototype. Yeah. And it's, it's also odd that this, even though there's no, there's no adapted scene, as you say, there's kind of a matched sensibility. Yeah. And it's very odd that a, that, a, that a young woman who's 16, 17 years old, who's a look, you know, you know, my kids are sort of that age, they, they're thinking about tomorrow and the day after, and you know, this girl identifies with a 70-year-old fisherman right. who's just had the, the biggest defeat of his life. You know? It's almost that like she's 16 and she's at the end of her life. Yeah. Uh, and you know, the, when, at the, when we first see them in the English class, the Miss Martinez is teaching the passive voice in English. And although it's not said so, I don't believe, she uses a, a line, a very famous line from The Old Man and the Sea. I mean, we used to have these things you call doble dichos, which are, you know, statements that you can turn around. Right. right. And one, one of the, his most famous doble dichos is, which is from The Old Man and the Sea, is man can be defeated, but not destroyed. You know? right. And that seems to be sort of the, you know, that's a th obviously one of the themes of the novel, and it seems to be the theme of the movie. But it's a, it's a, it's a strange philosophy, given that this girl is an every, you know, a philosopher for a 17-year-old young woman to adopt. Well, it's also interesting because, uh, let me describe the film that he made before this, yeah. uh, which is his first feature film, which is called Clandestinos. And it's about um, the mythology and history of the Cuban Revolution has frequently emphasized, you know, the activities, uh, the guerrilla activities in the countryside, in, in the mountains. And while there was guerrilla activity in, in, in Havana, I mean, witness the assassination that you were talking about of the, uh, of the chief chief of police. So Clandestinos is really a, a film, uh, you could say that Victor, her boyfriend, it's not literally the case, but you could say he's the hero of that. It's about the noble young people uh, involved in overthrowing, uh, overthrowing B Batista, who are, it's, 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 they're, they're, most of them die at the, at the end of the film, but for a higher, a higher purpose. What's interesting about this film is that we have the student activism portrayed. And we, and we, and we see the, the uh, uh, not that there's the implication that they're directly involved in guerrilla activities uh, yet, but, you know, we see the violence of the, uh, the police. We see her conflict over that. Mm -hmm. It's not a matter that she has to be the good girl, that a good girl is the one who joins uh, in this. And in fact, as you, you brought up earlier, um, uh, Victor is saying, well, why do you have to, there's so much to be done here and to be with me. Mm -hmm. And she, she rejects that. She rejects the fact that he can't understand it. And he, he also says, you know, a lot of people are doing this this way. You know, leaving Cuba is becoming very popular. And again, you wonder, well, what is he talking about? What Cuba is he talking about? In the late 50s, and a fair number of people went into exile, including Castro himself. Right. Um, but if one talks about exile in the context of Cuba, it's the last, you know, 44 years that's seen the, the most massive migration, obviously. So when Victor says to her, you know, you're leaving and why are you leaving? And, you know, you know, this has become very popular these days. Again, you wonder whether there's a double code there and whether one is supposed to read that allegorically. And even with Hemingway, you know, I, I, you know Hemingway is a sort of, as you say, this sort of you know, aloof, distant, unhelpful figure. Hemingway, perhaps, could have gotten her out of Cuba, you know? Uh, but she goes to his house and she's not allowed in by a black servant. Indeed. And, um, and then she can't leave Cuba. So I wonder if he's also saying something about how singularly unhelpful at times Americans have been um, toward Cubans and toward you know, relieving Cubans' plight in whatever way. Well, and of course, there, he, you know, that is referenced in a couple of ways. When she goes to the door, 
he can't write her the letter because he's in Africa. He's in, that's right. Because he has that mobility. He, I mean, if he, that's right. If he, if he, that's a good if point. he wants to go and hunt lions, he's Hemingway. He can do it. And her last images are her recalling of the old man's imagining of the lions on the beach. That's right. The lions on, this is the imagining of Africa. It's the imagining of the other side of, uh, of, of, of the ocean. So it... it, it and what's on the other side of the ocean, from where she's standing, is the United States, absolutely. not Africa. Oh, that's abso uh, abs absolutely the case. Well, I I'd also like to bring up the point, that, uh, coming back on something you said earlier, that at the end of the film, the film ends before the overthrow of the Batista revolution. It, it ends with her, you know, pouring coffee at the little, uh, you know, where her cousin has worked. And, and continues to work. So there's a way in which... I mean, I may be stretching things too far because this is how I make a living since I'm a literary critic. <laughs> right. But, you know, she has, to, she has to get a job and she has to work at night because she has a night shift at this cafeteria. Right. As you know, the early 90s, when this movie came out, saw the rise of jineterismo, yeah. the jineteras, right. you know, Cuban prostitution. This may be a very, very veiled reference to that you know, sad phenomenon. Well, it, it, I think um, it's a veiled reference, but I think it is a reference, and let me tell you why, because the issue has also come up with her mother, yes. with, her, with her mother as, as the question of whether her mother goes out and has actually been peddling in, in, in the streets, and that's, you know, a, a reference of a woman who has stepped outside of a traditional role, role even being a servant inside a house, to be engaged in an aggressive manner um, you know, soliciting customers or clients yeah. in a in a in a public space, and when you're do doing that at the at a, at a moment in which there's a rise in public public tr prostitution, I'm talking about the '90s, early '90s when this is made. You can't uh, you can't say something like that because when it's said about the mother, it says, well, she doesn't like being in the city and with those people, and you almost want to interpret, oh my goodness, is that one of the secrets? Of the of the film that her mother in fact has been engaged in in prostitution and then we later learn that no that's not that she's been peddling uh, uh, peddling things but th th how to put it in in that way a, an hypothesis is evoked right and then withdrawn but it's been there before it's been before that's it's right. been withdrawn yeah. and when I saw you know when I, there was that scene that you where she's talking to her brother. And she tells him, I'm very ashamed of having to make money this way. I, yes. And at that point, you know, I said, well, is she a prostitute? I mean, that's the first thing that pops into one's mind. Right. Later we find out, well, she's been selling food on the street, you know, or whatever. But as you say, you know, one can't help but think right. that that's what she's referring to. Well, let me give, let me give you, uh, f following your line of interpretation, let me just push it a couple of steps further in one direction. The actual action of this film ends before the Cuban Revolution. So... Um, if, if one wanted to give a, an official interpretation of, of, this, uh, of this film, you could say, well, in several years, her opportunities are going to change, that she will be somebody who may be now re-enfranchised for, for work in the university, etc. But that would be an interpretation that comes from, from our knowledge of history outside what's represented in the film, okay? But, but if you wanted take the allegorical interpretation, and this is about the 90s, well then, whatever opportunities she will have will come from historical events that will take place outside the scope right. of this film. But if this movie had been made in 1970 or 75 or 1980 and not in 1990 or 91, I, I bet you that at the end, that would have been written into the movie. I mean, the note of hopefulness. There would have been some, some <coughs> kind of symbolic uh, prophecy of the fact that things in a couple of years were going to change right. and that, well, you know, you had these movies like Lucia where that's what the movie's about, you right. know, and, you know, different time era. So, so the fact that it's not in the movie, you know, the fact that the movie stops short from exactly. the is, is in itself, I think, significant. Another interesting aspect of this is the text, the translation by Hemingway that they read. Okay, The Old Man the Sheep came out in 52. This was translated mm -hmm. into Spanish by a Cuban called Lino Novas Calvo, which is what they're reading. The irony is that Lino Novas Calvo, you know, left Cuba in the early 60s, became a professor at Syracuse University here in New York City. And at the time this movie was made, he was uh, uh, an invisible person. As far He was also a well-known writer, creative yeah, writer. Yes. You know, he was an invisible person, and his works had not been published in Cuba. 
in, you know, in what, 30 years. So the fact that they're actually using you know, Lino Novas's translation into Spanish or Hemingway is, is interesting, you know, and it's, a, you know, it's another way in which this movie takes a certain distance from, you know, the official line. Well, I should say that, that, that uh, uh, Fernando Perez began as a journalist and as a film critic. And uh, he has written very well about the works of one of his mentors in the film industry, the, the late and very great uh, uh, director Tomas Gutierrez Alea. And uh, Gutierrez Alea was himself a, a film theorist and, 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 and critic and talked about th that necessary engagement of cinema in that reflection, critical reflection, upon, um, upon society. And I think there's a way in which uh, this film, um, in its own way, is an homage to that aesthetic of, of Gutierrez, uh, of Gutierrez Alea, uh, an attempt to, you know, reinvent it through his own uh, personality as an artist and through his own circumstances uh, as an artist, who were, which are not the same as those of Gutierrez Alea making memories of underdevelopment uh, in the mid to late 60s or the Last Supper um, you know, in the, in, in the 70s. Uh, these are the conditions for a, um, a kind of reflective and analytical cinema um, that allows a number of different entrances yes. and a number of ways to come out with its, um, with its, with its significance. Yeah. So uh, we just have so, about a minute or so left, so is there anything else that you would want to draw people's attention to about this film, Gustavo, that, that you... Uh, perhaps admire about the film or found of, of keen interest about it? Well, I, I, I loved two things about the movie. I loved, as I said at the beginning, Havana. I was able to go back to Havana for, for a few minutes there. And then I found very interesting, you know, what we've been talking about, the way in which this movie, which was, you know, published right as things were falling apart in Cuba because so the special period was beginning, how it, how it, it takes little liberties and the ways in which it can create a certain space. I've got to take liberty with your liberty because we've run out of time, <laughs> but thanks. If you'd like more information about City Cinematheque or about this particular series, get in contact with us. And like so many things in the world today, the best way to do that is through the Internet. Please look us up at www.cuny.tv. Click on City Cinematheque or look around the site. You'll find the way to, to get in touch with us. Again, that website is www.cuny.tv. Gustavo, 30 minutes flew by. There's a lot more to talk about, but uh, I hope our viewers do it at, at home, and I hope you'll come back to talk about other things with us. Thank you, Jerry. Okay, a pleasure. And I hope that you join us once again as we go to see other Cuban films in this series, but as we also continue to look through the archives of film history, for an extraordinary art form and many of the things we haven't seen. Thanks for joining us today. Bye-bye.